Hello and welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today will be Mitch Light. This show is sponsored by the Well Coffee House. They turn coffee into water. The Well is a coffee house with a mission to bring clean water to the world. To date, they've helped over 30 communities across the globe have safe water, health, and hope. You can also make a difference by visiting a Well Coffee House today. There are five locations to serve you in the Nashville area. Those can be found in Brentwood, Green Hills, downtown Bellevue, and the Cool Springs Lifeway. More information can be found at wellcoffeehouse.org. The Well Coffee House, where coffee changes lives. We thank our co-sponsor, Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center, which is located in the Gulch. Our new today presented by Sutherland and Belk, a local injury law firm committed to helping those who've been injured in accidents. If you or somebody you know has been hurt in a wreck or another accident, reach out to Sutherland and Belk, see what your rights are. You can find their contact info online at sbinjurylaw.com. Good guys, give them a call if you have an issue with any of those things. Anyway, the honors continue to pour in for the Vandy boys. Kumar Rocker, was named the National Freshman of the Year by D1 Baseball, and Tim Corbin was named the Coach of the Year by his peers in the American Baseball Coaches Association. Today's guest line, presented by Bowl and Branch, which was started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. I've slept on these sheets for years, really missed them in Omaha when I did not have them for about a week and a half. And these are great sheets. They're fair trade certified. They've been made under safe conditions by men and women who are treated and paid fairly. Try them for a month. You can return them for free. You're not going to want to. But once you get the sheets, try the mattress. That was voted best mattress of 2018. Go to bowlandbranch.com. That is spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the promo code Vandy and get $50 off your first set of sheets. Mitch Light joins me now. He's the executive editor at Athlon Magazine. He has been the sideline announcer for Vanderbilt football. He has followed Vanderbilt baseball closely for a while. He was in Omaha for part of the trip. I saw him yesterday at the national title celebration. Mitch, appreciate you joining us today. How have you been, sir? Been very good. Very good. Um, I think we, we, yeah, we spoke last Saturday, I believe, after the Louisville game, but I had a great uh great time in Omaha and one of these times I'm going to roll the dice and go for the championship series or wait and to see if Vanderbilt gets in the championship series I had a lot of friends out there for the the final few games um so uh but I've always chosen to go the first weekend uh to guarantee some games at least but doing very well thanks I think I've developed a philosophy on this now because we had the same issue too I was able to get, we were able to get about nine days to be out there. And so what we did is we kind of straddled everything to where we said, okay, we'll we'll be out there. We're going to be out there for game one of the championship series. I bargained for a second game, um, could not make the third. And we couldn't quite get there in time for the first either. I watched that in St. Louis on our way out there. So I, I kind of, I got to see everything but the first game and the last game, which of course I watched on TV. I almost, this is my philosophy at watching these. I think if you've never been out there, I would say, is a Vander, if you're a Vanderbilt fan listening to this, which just about everybody is, if you get a chance to go in the future and haven't been, try to make it out there for the first couple of games so that you know that you've seen it. Once you've done that, the second time, I say, if you can only make a few games, Take a gamble and see if you can check, catch the championship series, and that's the way that you get the best of both worlds. But if you do it the first way, or if you, if you wait for the championship series the second time, then you may not get to see anything, and you definitely want to be there because that's an event that you never forget once you make it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, and, you know, there's there's different aspects. It's a long event, and the first weekend's great with all the fan bases there, and there's just more traffic, and it's just a bigger deal to be to be out there the, the, the first weekend, um, especially if it's your first time, you really get a feel for the event as a whole. Now, have, never having been to the championship series, I don't. it seems like a good environment, but it's just basically two fan bases and then a lot of locals there. So it's just not, the, I would imagine it's not quite the same feel. Um, so I, yeah, I, I agree with your, your philosophy. Um, if you've got the freedom to drive or you, the, the willingness to drive, I guess is the better word than you, you can kind of, decide the last minute just you know it's just buying plane tickets if you wait to the end it gets so expensive yeah I think that's what I'm going to do next year I mean it'd be great to be out there from start to finish I'm lucky that we stayed with a lot of friends and family 
in the Omaha and Lincoln areas because, again, if you listen to the podcast, that's where my wife is from. Uh, so, but I don't know how the people that don't have that luxury do it. I mean, there's some certainly that fan base has got its share of people who are wealthy. And maybe if, if you're the parent or a player or something like that, you make some sacrifices the rest of us can't. But it does get expensive. Yeah, it does. I mean, because hotels are expensive there. And then you're, you know, unless you're, be, unless you're at a place where you can cook, you got to go out to eat all the time and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, well, maybe when I'm retired, I'll, I'll run in Winnebago and I'll drive out there and stay for two weeks. Looks like a lot of fun. There you go. I'm going to ask you this question and I want to get your perspective on it. And you, you can feel free to, to put on two different hats here or answer it how you want. You, you can answer this as a fan and then maybe as a journalist because you, you are both. Where does this rank in terms of Vanderbilt stories? Is it is it bigger than 2014? Is is there something else that's in there? I, I want to get your perspective on how you experience that both ways. Um, I think 2014 was bigger, in my opinion. Um, definitely as a fan of the school, it was bigger because it was the first time. And as good as the program had been – you know, heading into 2014, it's still only been to Omaha one time, you know, and I, 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 you know, looking back, it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, you don't want revisionist history, but after making a huge splash early, getting to the super regional in 2004, the great season in 2007, there's a lull in the program from 2008 to, you know, 10. I mean, it, not, there's no complaints, still a very good program, made a super regional in 2010, all that, but you, 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 excuse me, Chris, you weren't quite sure, hey, maybe is the window shut or, you know, just throwing things out there. But then, so then 2011, they break through again. And then you have the great 2013 season. And then 2014, obviously, you win it all. So I, I just think uh, winning the first time was, was great. Now, you could argue that this team is a better story, maybe because of, from a journalistic standpoint, and those covering the team, you've asked Adam Sparks, he didn't cover the 14 team, but you know, he was in Nashville. I would say the 2019 team is a better story. There are better stories on that team. Probably, you know, I'm looking back, you know, you had Dan Swanson who ended up being the number one pick, but you got the, uh, the unfortunate, obviously Donnie Everett story, but then you've got, um, you know, JJ Blade, you got the Tyler Brown story. So, um, I both huge for the school. Um, as we, dive deeper and deeper into the social media era. It's, it seems like this one, just there's more national buzz about Vanderbilt, but I don't, I don't know. I'd have to look back, think back to 2014. So, but I'm always, uh, uh, we'll, we'll lean towards the first one, you know, being a uh, huge New York Yankees fan and people will probably scoff at this, but there was a time, you know, I'm, I'm 47 and throughout most of my youth, Yankees weren't that good in the 80s. I mean, they had some good teams, but they never won anything. So when they finally won in 96, like, that was the greatest. So, like, people, you know, they went on to win, what, three in a row and five of six or four or five. I mean, the, the, the first time they won will always be the best, just like for Vanderbilt. For me, the first time they won will be the best. I like your answer. And as you were talking, it, it spurred some thoughts in my mind. I think th- this is where I settle. I don't think this is – necessarily the right answer. This is just my opinion. I think from a journalistic standpoint, this was bigger. Uh, And by the way, a lot more people covering it. I want to get into that in just a minute with you. But this is kind of, it just seems like there was a poetic element about this season. Tim Corbin said something, and you were there to hear it, talk about how no season happens without the background of the ones before it. And I think that obviously the terrible tragedy with Donnie Everett was always the backdrop against which this was set. You had kids who'd been part of number one recruiting classes who never quote unquote realized their potential. Uh, But, but for reasons we all as, as human beings understand, you know, you look back a year ago, Mitch, 13 months ago, we're debating, do they even get in a regional? They had to get hot, sweep Kentucky the last week. And of course, they beat Clemson and win the regional and, and get into one of the, the greatest all-time series against Mississippi State uh, before they're eliminated, before what would have been a surprise trip to Omaha. So you have, you have that. That's kind of the start of it. 
you know, the Everett's were on the stage. Obviously, that was a big part of the story, but you had the kids that had still been dealing with it. You had the expectations. I think those two teams, before it never finished where they were ranked in preseason, again, the recruiting hype, all those things tied together. And then at the end, I said the poetic element, you, you had them avenging the loss to Mississippi State. You had them avenging the 2013 loss to Louisville in, in one of the most heartbreaking series they ever had. You had those factors. And, and then you finally had the one, the greatest heartbreak probably in Vanderbilt sports history for what was at stake was the 2007 regional. And and <laughs> they they win that thing against the team that, that knocked them out of that in Michigan, which nobody ever expected. And, and to add to that, you have Eric Backett, who was Tim's top assistant, or, or one of his two top assistants, along with Derek Johnson in the dugout, coaching the other team. I just think that the way it stacked up from a story standpoint, again, you experience these things differently as fans and as journalists. The more that I think about it, the more it just pops into my head. I'm like, this just was, from a writing standpoint, it was a dream. Yeah, in you know, the, the seasons were so different. I mean, 2014, team goes 17 and 13. It was a great team, but, you know, there, there were stretches. I think they came back from Knoxville with a 7-8 and eight record in SEC at one point. Um, it's been talked about a lot. They go two and out in Hoover, I believe, that year. Um, this the, the, the feeling of the season was just so different. I, they did, you know, after losing that um, – we're, they're five and four at one point, you know, one and two. And then I forgot it was how they ended up five. Was it coming back from the Georgia series? They were five, whatever, five and four. Then they got in that incredible run after that. So there's a different feeling from that point on where it's like, okay, we know this is a super regional, uh, you know, team that's going to host expectations, not don't blow it. Just can they fulfill those expectations where you weren't really thinking that in 2014 because, you thought this was a team that if it got hot at the right time, it could do some great things, which it did. Um, so I think there's more pressure on this team and how fans treat that, internalize that's up to them. You know, where they go, oh, we, we can't blow this or we have the best team we're going to win. And I mean, people, the psychology of being a fan is an entirely different topic. But um, yeah, I mean, both both great. I, I think what it does, it just cements Tim Corbin and Vanderbilt baseball again, you know, as a maybe the, the number one program in the country, you know, you got two titles in a six year span, three championship series in, in a six year span, five super regionals in the six year span, um, or sitting no more than that. You can, you know, obviously going back to 13, even further back. So, um, not that there's any pressure on a program to win a second. Cause once you've already won one, that's, you've kind of kicked the door in. Uh, but I think this sets them up, you know, for future teams. And I remember I kind of had this feeling, too. I remember Mike Rooney tweeted this after last season. And you could just you could just see it, the dynamic of the team and the way they continue to recruit that he thought Vanderbilt was set up for a, a, a nice another run of Omaha trips beginning with 2019. And I kind of felt that, too, after last season, that just the way things were, were falling into place that this that the program was ready to take it up a notch and be even more consistent than it had been and and so far so good. Yeah, from the moment they got done with the draft, I knew this was a top two or three team. The debate at the time was would it be Vanderbilt or LSU, which which seems like a silly debate now. It wasn't at the time, and of course LSU had some injuries and some things that that caused some underperformance, but. From that point on, the target was on their back. We talked about all the other things that, that led into that. But I remember before the season, I was doing some predictions, and I said I thought that they would go, I believe I said 41 and 15 and 21 and 12 in the league, or 20, excuse me, 21 and 9 and win the conference. And I remember I, I published that story. It was either opening day or the day before it was in the three two one that I do I, I could be off but I'm, I'm pretty sure I said 41 and 14 or 42 and 14 or whatever that would have been and and 21 and nine I thought you know I think I was probably a game generous on the conference record and it, you could be great it's just hard to lose that few games I didn't go into postseason because you don't know how that's going to shape out. It just It's hard to predict. All I have is the schedule in front of me, and you size up the teams, and you, you make the call on that. And I remember thinking, I, I think I've set the bar just, just a hair too high. 
and, and I'll be darned if they didn't exceed it uh, and exceed it by a good bit. And and that's when the bar is that high, really the only thing you can do, the most realistic thing that you can do is probably disappoint people or, or maybe at best meet expectations. Somehow I think that they managed to exceed everything. Yeah. I mean, part of that's just being very talented and part of it is being, you know, having all the veterans on the team, you know, that's something that's, not tangible. Well, I guess it's tangible having veterans, but you you never know the, the kind of mix you're going to have. It it just happened to be the right mix of veterans. You know, I think we've seen in college baseball, you can have seniors on the team that are kind of bitter, that don't want to be there. They're there for the wrong reasons. Well, these guys were clearly there for the right reasons. So I think that helped. And, um, you know, it's difficult. And, you know, we've both been following SEC baseball enough to know it's if you're predicting anything over 20 wins for a team, that's that's a lot, you know. You, uh, obviously, we've seen it. We saw Vanderbilt win 26 games. Vanderbilt won 22 games uh, in 2011. But you know, you can win the league a lot with with a 20 and 10 record. Um, so you know, I, this team did a good job of taking care of business against inferior opponents. Like the SEC East has been, you know, there's been some some, some of the weaker teams in the, the league have been in that division. Well, they've they've taken care of those. When you sweep some teams like that, that really helps your record. But obviously. This, this, this strength of schedule ended up being incredible. Like, you know, you can go to warrennolan.com and look at all the, 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 uh, the, uh, what's the phrase? Not group one, the, um, quadrant one. Yeah. Quadrant one wins. It's just incredible what, what Vanderbilt did. And, and, and you can say with how good Michigan played down the stretch, you can challenge how good they were for the season, but beating Louisville twice and Mississippi state to get to the championship series. I don't know. And I, we'd have to go back and look at this. I don't know if there's been a team in the, you know, in the last 10 years, it's had a more difficult road to get once they've been in Omaha to get to the championship series. Um, you know, just to, to, I think most of us would agree that the three best teams in the country or the three best teams in Omaha were probably Vanderbilt, Louisville and Mississippi State. Vanderbilt had to beat Louisville twice and then Mississippi State once. Um, and I, like I said, Michigan was playing like a top 10 team late in the year. You know, obviously they didn't for the whole season, but with that pitching, they clearly were. Yeah, I like to look at some other computer rankings out there and because the thing about the RPI is it's held down by your schedule. Michigan played a pretty weak schedule on the whole. I don't think it got some of the better teams in the Big Ten. It's out-of-conference schedule was pretty bad, and that, that holds down your RPI. But the other rankings, I think uh, Boyd's World was one, and there's a composite computer poll out there that pulls in some rankings that, that are hard to find elsewhere. But Michigan was always a team that ranked higher in those than it did the RPI. And, and hats off to Aaron Fit. I listened to the D1 podcast most weeks, and he said for a while, uh, this was way before the NC tournament, he said, Michigan's a talented team, you know, they – I think that the context was debating whether they could make the tournament. Said, but, you know, they're, they're, he said all year, they're really good, and, and boy, they were. Yeah, no, I was impressed. And, you know, obviously they're pitching. Now, clearly they didn't have the pitching depth that, you know, they got by with with um, with what they needed. You know, the three pitchers obviously well documented there. Um, but their lineup was strong. I mean, they were aggressive. They, you know, they, they – Ran a lot. They put pressure on the defense. You know, every, everything that we that was said during the broadcast and that that you know we saw with our own eyes. They were they were really good. And you know, baseball is such a strange sport about getting hot, and that's why there were some comparisons to the 2014 Vanderbilt team, which you know, from a talent standpoint, was more talented than this Michigan team, but a team that just played well at the right times and and had that certain magic going for it. And you know, Michigan was you know one one away from one of the uh, you know I guess you throw it up there with. Fresno State is some one of the, the unlikeliest champion in, in the last 20 years. Probably the most interesting thing about the way the series played out to me is you look in Major League Ball right now and, you know, five, six inning starts are the norm. And in postseason, you're just thinking, oh, I don't want to see this guy out of the pen or that guy out of the pen. And it's mix and match. And Louisville's a team where they had a number of good relievers and there were several other teams in the field that were the same way, but this was interesting. This was more of an old school thing because it was like those were teams in Michigan and Vanderbilt that want to ride their starters as long as they could. And, and it just was an odd dynamic that starting pitching wound up being the difference uh, more so than the bullpen. Yeah, no doubt about it. And Tim Corbin mentioned that several times yesterday and couldn't agree more. You know, the 14 team one with the bullpen, um, the, the 19 team one with starters and, you know, I, I jotted, jotted this down, and I, I didn't do the starters. Or, you know, we, we can kind of figure this out easily. But in the 12 postseason starts, I mean, 
Vanderbilt gives up two runs against Ohio State, five runs against Ohio, uh, Indiana State, and how many runs did Kumar give up in that game? One or two? Um, which that's, game that's, again? That's I've got the box scores in front that of was me. The, that was the Tyler Brown implosion game. Oh, um, let me see. I am getting there. Oh, let's see. Kumar. I'm saying, fella. Okay. Oh, Indiana State. I'm sorry. Rocker went six innings, gave up one run. It was earned, seven hits, eight strikeouts, no walks. And then, of course, Brown went a third of an inning, gave up four, three earned. Yeah, okay. So we'll go through this real quick. We don't, Vanderbilt as a team gives up two against Ohio State, five against Indiana State, but only one from the starter. One the next day against Indiana State. Obviously, the 18 against Duke, I think, fellows gave up five. Duke, zero runs. Duke, two runs. Louisville, one run. Mississippi State, three runs. I think one by the starter. Louisville, two runs. Uh, Michigan, seven runs. Michigan, one run. Michigan, two runs. So eight of the 12 postseason games, NCAA tournament games, Vanderbilt starters gave up two runs or less. That's how you win a national championship. Um, If you don't have, you know, I think we all know who follow Vanderbilt closely. They kept talking about all the arms. This was not the deepest bullpen um, as far as reliability. Brown doesn't get, you know, other than that Indiana start w- was phenomenal. I've always been a Jake Eater fan. It's glad to see him get an opportunity to close out. Like I felt, you know, King had some, King got some big outs in the postseason, but basically you wanted the starters and then Eater and Brown were the two guys you felt the most comfortable with. Yeah, they they had the luxury of their relievers or guys that can go 40, 50 pitches easily if needed. I mean, both Brown and, and Eater showed up basically as starters. And right. you, you could see, I, I think at least one of them probably returned to that role next year. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if either one. I mean, right now, you'd have to uh, obviously say Kumar Rocker and Mason Hickman, who, you know, go look at Mason Hickman's numbers. Just phenomenal this year. He might go down as one of the more, I don't think he'll go down as one of the more underappreciated since he ended up winning the national championship game. But, um, his numbers are phenomenal. So those two, and then, you know, I would say Tyler Brown and Eater would be the next two guys in line unless Jack Leiter comes in and lights it up immediately. But, um, uh, you know, it's, you know, uh, wouldn't be surprised at all if Brown's a starter next year. Of course, the, the stat that everybody talks about is the batting average. I think it was the lowest batting average to win in Omaha since the 70s. Of course, I would like to see on base percentage because that's really the bigger stat with them. It's the bigger stat in baseball, but this is also a lineup that walks a lot because you're afraid of, of the power and the contact ability. So uh, offense does manifest itself in, in different ways, but it just was so strange that the offense carried them out all year and then you had this role reversal in Omaha where the pitching does it. But I'm looking at it too, and boy, you know they, they never had an easy road from start to finish of the NCAA tournament in terms of the arms that they faced. No, I mean looking back, you know, we said that we analyzed the the regional, and you know, I know Indiana State was a good team and all, but they, you know, pretty much cruised through that. Then after that, plays faced two really good arms from Duke. And then Duke uh, did not have the depth there. You know, that, that was clear early in game three. But then in the NCAA tournament, faced good pitching. I mean, I got so many friends or texts and you'd see, you know, what's wrong with the hitting? Thought we could hit. And I was like, it's, you know, it's a common eight. Well, it's baseball. You know, that's an answer for a lot of answers. <laughs> it's, it's baseball that happens. But it's they're facing good pitching every game. And, you know, not that people don't scout in the regular season, but I'm sure the scouting's even heavier in the postseason. Um, and then you start to press and all that. So, you know, I – would it have been better if Vanderbilt scored six to ten runs in every game? Sure, but I, you know, you're you're in the College World Series. Each team has probably you know at least two really good arms. Yeah, and here's the way I see it: in postseason, it's really about your top five or six arms. Ohio yeah. State was probably the only team that they played that didn't have five or six really good arms. Indiana State, I think, had that uh, for sure, which is what made them tough. And and then you, they got into game three and. Indiana State got in the loser's bracket and had to burn some of those guys. So Vanderbilt did its damage against the guys that were outside of that. Well, Duke had three or four guys. They had the two starters that, that pitched pretty well. That Then they got into Carey and Gerard and those guys, and they didn't pitch as well. And that's where Vanderbilt ran away with it. Really, the, the problem was with Vanderbilt playing Louisville and Mississippi State, those were the kind of teams that fit that mold. And uh, where they separated themselves against Michigan, Michigan really had – 
three really good arms. And, and kind of once Michigan exhausted those guys, although the Page kid pitched pretty well, that's where Vandy did its damage. But in terms of framing it, those top five or six arms, that was about as tough a draw as they could have gotten. Yeah, no, I agree. And I want to go back to something I said earlier. Like, I don't want to dismiss some of the guys on the team, but like, you know, all these guys are good. Like Isaiah Page is a good example. He's clearly got a good arm. He just hadn't really been put in that spot and he performed really well in that spot. I mean, if, if, if Vanderbilt had to throw Hugh Fisher in an emergency situation in the third inning, he's obviously good enough to pitch really well. He has pitched really well. I'm just talking about from a reliability standpoint. You know, there's a lot of guys in there on that staff that, that have done it in the past and might go on to good careers in pro baseball but just at this juncture just from watching this team there's only a few guys you felt really good about looking back from the start of the season was there anything that really surprised you one way or the other if you would have told me that Jackson Gillis threw seven innings for this team I'd say oh wow it stinks he got hurt or this team wasn't very good like you know there's certain guys you just kind of I've always been a big Jackson Gillis fan I remember seeing Carson Fulmer at a fall ball scrimmage, and I was with a guy who used to play college baseball, and I said, is this kid, is, you know, I knew who Fulmer was, but, you know, didn't really know how good he was going to be, obviously. I said, is this guy as good as I think he is? And the guy was like, yeah, he's incredible. Well, I saw Gillis, you might have even been there, it was a freshman year, just a random midweek game, came in in, like, the seventh inning and threw two nasty curveballs and then, like, a 95-mile-per-hour pitch struck out the side. I was like, this guy's got an incredible arm. So I've always had really high hopes for him. So, I mean, that's kind of a minor one. But, uh, you know, I, I think one thing that's, that was interesting, I guess, is the the stability of the lineup, which we'd never see from a Tim Corbin team. I mean, we, sure, things fall into place. But even last year in the regionals, I mean, I have to go back and look, you know, when they tweet out the lineups an hour, hour and a half before, oh, you know, oh, this guy's starting today. Oh, this guy's batting, whatever. I mean, what is it for the last, basically ever since Cooper Davis got hurt and DeMarco came back, the lineup was almost exactly the same. I mean, the stability of the lineup, I guess, would be one that was surprising to me. Um, and, you know, the fact that guys like Jason Gonzalez didn't play, Cooper Davis, you know, didn't play. There's a lot of good players on the bench. Yeah, I don't know that, Again, there are so many storylines with this team. I can't just pick one and tell you they won because of this or or they won because of that. I don't think it's that easy. But I think if you have three or four storylines, this is one of them. It was depth. And we talked about that from the first year. We said this may be the deepest roster, 1-35, to that Tim has had. I I think it absolutely played out that way. And, And this was a team, we kind of forget the adversity it faced at different points, but there was a lot here. I mean, they they really, they lose Cooper Davis right during that Arkansas series, who was playing at a really high level for them. And he basically was a non-factor the rest of the year because other guys jumped up and seized time, but that's a starting outfielder. And I don't know about an, an all-SEC caliber outfielder, but kind of on the fringe of that, he was he was a very good player, maybe even a star. You lose DeMarco for, what, a month, um, who's their starting center fielder, and and Pat had struggled before that, too. So Pat was basically a non-factor the first half of the season. You mentioned Gillis. Let's throw Zach King in there. I think King, if we're saying who are their five most reliable arms before the year, King is in that mix. Well, it, it didn't happen. You mentioned Jason Gonzalez, who hit well when he played but couldn't find a spot. If you said Jason Gonzalez isn't really going to contribute a whole lot you just said, okay, they, they take a ding there. Uh, if you said Infante is not going to quite get back to where he was, although he had his moments, he was better than last year. That was a thing that you hoped they'd get. And then you have Drake Fellows, who didn't quite have the season that you hoped out of your number one starter. That's a lot of things that usually when you win a title, you're saying, okay, all these things had to go right, and, and this guy had to exceed expectations, and that guy had to. They had a lot of guys that, for whatever reason, didn't contribute as much as we thought, and and yet they're 59 and 12. And that just, if, if that doesn't make a statement about the roster balance and depth and overall talent, then I don't know what does. Yeah, and I'll, ca- I'll counter that by saying some pos- more positives. I would say infield defense. I mean, the F- Harrison Ray. Uh, made some of the most spectacular plays by Vanderbilt infielder we have seen. Didn't always, you know, I'm looking eight errors. That's not bad for an uh, everyday second baseman, a guy who played six, 66 games. Made some spectacular plays in, in, in Omaha. The fact that Ethan Paul and Steven Scott come back and Paul's average dipped a bit, 
uh, down the stretch, but had better than expected years or, or bounced back from discipline. You know, I know Scott was really hot at the end of last year, but okay, both Scott and Paul were better as seniors as they were than they were as juniors. So I think the, in, in the fact that uh, Austin Martin and J.J. Bladé were so good, were first-team All-America good. Um, so th- those are some things that were better than maybe we expected. So, um, and, you know, let's – Ethan Paul, go, dating back to the Super Regional home run to tie it, I don't know if there's a guy that's had as many big hits in his career as Ethan Paul. I mean, the, the, the double to tie the – uh, Louisville game. I'm sure I'm missing some. Seems he hit, didn't he hit the walk off? Or did he hit a tie, hit a home run in the ninth or the seventh inning? Maybe to tie Ole Miss in that doubleheader sweep last year. I just think that anecdotally, just thinking back, the kid has hit some monster home runs and some monster base hits. No, I agree with that, and that reminds me because you brought up something. I'm glad you did because it's been in my head, but I forgot to talk about it. The one place where I think they exceeded expectations was defense. Now, I don't think that was one of their better defensive outfields ever. Um, yeah. it, it was it was not a bad one, and I think Stephen Scott gave them um, a really good play in that last Michigan game, making that catch against the wall, which kind of got lost in the shuffle of, of everything else. But I think Ethan Paul, that was a best-case scenario at short. I don't think any of us – we knew Ethan was a good player. I don't think any of us had any clue – that he would be that good at short. He just was so dependable. Uh, he might make a mistake every now and then, but he never made two, uh, something Tim alluded to with the team. I think Austin Martin wildly exceeded expectations at third. Um, after he got past the rough first few weeks of being over, this is a kid that like doesn't have a position, and he's playing all over the diamond. He doesn't have any rhythm and, and the, the constant reps at third. He was a gold glove third baseman. In the SEC, none of us saw that coming. I think Philip Clark, for most of the year, was a better defensive catcher than we'd expected. And maybe not better than they'd expected. They got to see him in the winter and the fall in places where we didn't. Uh, and Infante was was pretty good at first, as usual. You mentioned Harrison Ray was spectacular at times. It's short. I think that, again, w- w- the expectations for this team were so high, it was hard to exceed them. I think they they did it though defensively, Mitch. Yeah, no, I, I, and I would much rather be stronger infield defense and outfield defense. And it wasn't like you'd say it wasn't a bad outfield defense. It was just solid. You know, there was no one. That you just I don't remember just a ton of great plays in the outfield being made. I remember a lot of really really good plays in the infield. Um, so yeah, and, and um, just the you know I think that like you said the catching was 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 solid. Uh, both those guys were good. It's interesting in the championship game that, that he went with uh, Clark over Duvall, who Clark did, done, did a great job blocking balls throughout the College World Series. I guess that was the difference there. I don't know if it was Duvall's throwing error, which led to the change, but that was the one change we saw where in a weekend series, a three-game series all year, Duvall, you would catch one game. Um, I guess it was Raby earlier in the year uh, um, is, is the one guy he would start. And one thing that they that – they, um, was interesting too, and I think uh, on Max Max Hertz, one of he did a great job with the podcast after the game. He interviewed a ton of people. I think it was fascinating that that basically that they they let Kumar Rocker call his own game as a freshman. Him and Clark worked together. I mean, this is it's well documented that in college baseball, if you watch it, you know how often you see the catcher look to the coach and the coaches call pitches. Well, this guy's a true freshman and basically let him call his own game. I thought that was amazing. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Max. I forgot to mention him. I did a podcast with Chip Frederick before I did with you. It, it, it'll air, and, and we talked about the media coverage. Uh, Max was another guy that I didn't mention did a great job out there, and I thought he was great on the broadcast during the year, too. But I want to ask you, again, you're the guy to ask this because you have a perspective of Vanderbilt and of the media. Um, before I get into the media, I think college baseball, though, is is really growing. The crowds out there were good. Um, Nashville, I think, was really engaged with this team. This seems to me like a sport on the rise. No, I, yeah, I think it is. Um, it, the coverage gets better and better every year. Um, SEC Network, since it's been around, has been phenomenal for that. Um, you know, uh, I think ESPN does a really good job. I don't want to get too much into the, the announcing crews they they use. If you follow me on Twitter, you've known my dis satisfaction with, uh, you know, I, I think they've got some of the best guys like Tom Hart, Chris Burke, Kyle 
Peterson. Peterson was on the broadcast, but they don't utilize their best in their biggest games. They will be, will some guys, some national guys in, but that's another story there. So yeah, no, I, I think it was, it was a big story locally, nationally. Um, I, I listened, and I, I think Adam Sparks does a tremendous job covering Vanderbilt, and I think Joe Rexford is the best columnist that Nashville has had since I've been here, and he does a great job covering as well. Um, you know, a guy come. I've talked to him about this or, over Twitter, brief conversation. You know, he said he loves baseball. He just never really covered it. And obviously, coming from Michigan, you didn't really, aside from the fact that Michigan's good now, didn't really cover college baseball. Uh, I thought he did a great job from Omaha as well. And I listened, they did about a 15 or 20 minute podcast and they didn't give numbers, but they were talking about the popularity of Vanderbilt baseball and said that their numbers, that, you know, the, the, the measures they use now is hits traffic to the, their stories and they're, they're off the charts. I mean, they do very, very well. You know, that's why they send Joe Rex Road out there. So I think Vanderbilt fans and other people in Nashville or around the country are reading coverage of Vanderbilt baseball in the Tennessee and obviously what you do, what Max did. So I, yeah, I, I think that, the, the coverage was outstanding, and it will just continue to grow. Yeah, I want to see where you think this heads next. Again, I was, I was, I was floored with the number of media there to cover them between internally at Vanderbilt and in the Nashville market. And you had a lot of people following it from home. I'm, I'm driving home. At least two, at least two of the three local networks had TV people out there, right? I think yeah, actually, yeah. I think three of the four. If you can kind of, I think there was three TV. Um, which I think the last in 14 and 15, there might have been none. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I said this on an earlier podcast. When I was out there in 14 and 15, it was me, the one guy the Tennessean sent, and Vanderbilt's media durations. Vanderbilt didn't even send a photographer, uh, I think, in 14. So to see it from where it was to where it is now in just such a short amount of time uh, is, is, is unreal. I'm, I'm wondering, and of course, you, you know, the, the talk in Nashville, you had a couple of guys on talk shows, and I'm, I'm not going to get in a media war with anybody or, or despair, but I mean, just had some really bad takes that did not age well in the interest of, of college baseball. But I'm wondering bet- between that, between the momentum of the title and the fact that they've got the face of college baseball the next two years and, and the fact that he's a minority certainly does not hurt at a time where baseball is having trouble attracting those kids. I think you were really starting to see – it's hard to predict the future. Maybe there's just there's a one-off thing that goes away, but it, it seems to me, and I want your opinion, but it does seem to me like we're at the beginning of a trend, and I think the next step will be, of course, help from college baseball and the draft and that stuff and, and maybe getting that move back and tying it in more with Omaha. But it, it seems to me like maybe we'll look back on this 10 years, 20 years from now and say this was really when the boom began. Yes and no. I, I think – College baseball, at least in big markets like Nashville, the postseason comes at a perfect time. There's not much else going on. Titans haven't started. The Predators are done. It's the sport to cover. I, I don't think, you know, at, at places like Starkville, Mississippi and Baton Rouge, Louisiana, it's always going to be different because it's literally the only game in town there. But, uh, you know, uh, is, is Vanderbilt – Florida or Vanderbilt Ole Miss in, in, in you know, April going to be a huge local story in baseball. It might be if Kumar Rocker throws a, you know, a one hitter or something. So I think as an observer of the local media and an alum of the, fan of the school, I think Vanderbilt baseball gets the coverage it quote unquote deserves. Sure. During the season would it be a little better if the Tennesseans sent more people out there. Yeah, but I get it. Adam Sparks is covering basketball. There's, there's a lot to do there. So I, I think it will continue to grow. I don't think it's going to approach the other, you know, the, the other main college sports, football and basketball uh, yet or is close to that. But I, I think it's sort of a perfect storm. The fact that it's happening in June, uh, it makes it the event to cover. Well, that and it probably didn't hurt them that the Predators bowed out so early, too. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and uh, you know, the College World Series is after even if the Predators made the Stanley Cup Finals, but they, they battled so early, it allowed some more kind of ramp-up time, if that makes sense. Yeah. By the way, your your buddy and your working partner, Braden Gall, had one of the better tweets I saw during Omaha. I think, if the, think the tweet was almost word for word. There are two kinds of people, people who love college baseball and terrorists. <laughs> Yeah, never, brains never want to, you know, just uh, exaggerate or anything. So, well, not at all. But that that was funny. Also, well, I, I, I can say I'm not a terrorist. 
Well, I, I was pretty sure you weren't. I, that's that's kind of a, a show policy. We don't have terrorists on the air yeah, here, sure. but you, um, you don't you don't negotiate with terrorists, and you don't have them as uh, guests. No, no, not at all. <laughs> but uh, and also, and and I think that this is where the way that they handle things helps them. I just think the national media really loves to cover them uh, for the most part. Um, just the the way that Corbin handles his business, the first class operation they run. I, I just think that like, I, I'll give you an example. I, Chris Childers, I saw Chris out at the national title celebration yesterday. I didn't see him with a mic or anything. I think he was there just to watch it as an observer. He brought his, one of his kids with him. Yeah. Um, I just think that, I think that there's a lot of respect in the media that, that you don't even see with that program. Yeah. Yeah. It's to- totally, that's the case. And there's, you know, it's, we've, it's been talked about. There are Tennessee football fans, Alabama football fans who are Vanderbilt baseball fans because you know, they love Corbin. It's just sort of a different, it's own little, different little animal there. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, there's no doubt that, that the people, that the media attention is greater because Corbin is so good. He's so good with the media. He's, he gets that he needs to be, you know, uh, he, he needs to make time still trying to sell his sport and sell, you know, sell Vanderbilt in, in a busy sports market. So, yeah, he, he totally gets it. And, and I thought, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, Vanderbilt's done, a, uh, I think, a tremendous job internally. You know, Alan George, the new sports information director there, you know, he's now he's an assistant athletic director, associate athletic director. How many people they had out there, you know, photographers, social media people, digital media people they had, uh, you know, in addition to Andy Pate, who's the sports information guy. I'm counting one, two, three. They had at least four other people out there the entire time. I know they they brought in a freelance photographer from California uh, to to work uh, to shoot for the athletic department because there were some other conflicts with the university uh, photographers who ended up going anyway late in in the process there. So they were very well staffed. And if you follow, uh, you know, I'm sure everyone listening here follows all the social media accounts that you, you saw some of the great stuff they put out. Today's mailbag is sponsored by Vanderbilt fan and independent insurance agent Josh Minton of Brentwood. You need an insurance agent who wants to know your unique needs and circumstances and will tailor an insurance plan to fit them. Josh is your guy. Call him 615-933-1979. Email him at josh at hqinsurance.com. Follow him on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash JD Minton HQ. He's my agent. Give him a shot and I know you're going to be pleased. VU Perrier says, what was it like covering Vanderbilt baseball during the early 1990s? So I was in school from 89 to 93. Uh, I was a sports editor of the Hustler in my sophomore year, first semester, second semester, sophomore year, first semester, junior year. You know, so we covered the team. I personally probably never covered a baseball game when I was in college because when I was a sports editor, um, I covered football and basketball more. Um, did We covered it. We Bill Troch and I, I think did a pretty good job covering it with the Commodore Report because once basketball season was over, we did it. We would go to the games and cover. It was just there, there was a, there was some star power there. There's the Clinton Johnsons of the Johnstons of the world, and you know, Vanderbilt, Josh Paul had some first rounders there, but you know, uh, obviously not even close to to what it is now or what it became once Tim Corbin started. So I've always I would go to the games when I was a student, uh, not a ton because it's just. Um, you know, there's a lot, lot going on there, but uh, I've always been a fan of the baseball team. It's I didn't just jump on board when they got good. Um, so it's as you can imagine, it's changed a lot. Five Star Door says, was this the best Vandy baseball team of all time? How would this team compare to the 2014 or 15 squad? Not to downplay any of those teams, but winning multiple College World Series championships gives you the luxury to have these kinds of hypothetical discussions just for fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously this has been a hot topic. I would say we talked a lot about the 14 team, how, you know, they went 17 and 13 in the league and there were times during the season where they were really struggling. I would say this team, because, you know, because it won that you have to say, this is the best Vanderbilt team ever. Um, I still go back the 2013 team was pretty, pretty darn good. And, you know, the pitching, this team's hitting was obviously the best. That that thirteen teams hitting was very good too. You you, you look back at the the pitching and the the bullpen in two thousand thirteen was great. Um, the bullpen in two thousand fourteen was great. I think Hayden Stone will go down as one of the most. His freshman year, I guess, in, in fourteen 
one of the one of the best seasons by any venerable pitcher, you know, coming out of the bullpen. I know I'm kind of rambling here, but uh, I'd say the fact that this team won it, the offense was the best, and the starting pitching was so good in the postseason. I, I think you'd have to say this is the best one. Yeah, I look at that as is not just how do you end, but what did you do during the season? Were you balanced? I mean, certainly that was the most balanced combination of regular season. And and postseason and, and and not to mention they they got a number two overall national seed could I mean really the only thing missing in that resume was that they got the number two overall national seed but it could have easily been one I mean that that is that is incredible it's so hard to do yeah yeah I mean basically wire to wire um, and you can debate two versus one I think all of us no one really cared that they were the number two national seed you could argue it took some pressure off them and stuff like that so. Um, very few hiccups along the way. I mean, just looking back, the only time, you know, the, the Texas A&M Saturday game and the Arkansas Sunday game, the, the bullpen blew. Um, you know, this team made made a sweat a little bit, the Duke series and the Michigan series. But, uh, you know, even the championship game was pretty stress-free there. So uh, it's hard not to say this is the best one. The one, the two big holes you can poke in the team were were the number one starter, but if you just rearrange that a little bit and say Rockers you one, Hickman's your two, Fellows is your three, then you look at Fellows and say they've they've got a an excellent three starter. So that one is just a little not even smoke and mirrors, but you just rearrange the way you look at it, and that was fine. The other question they had was was the bullpen, and what you had there was you just it was the bridge to get from the starters to Brown was questionable. But, you know, they did – Eater was really good at times. Ethan Smith was good at times. Hugh Fisher was good at times. That's still the the negative thing. But what you had was you had the things that offset it. You had pitchers that could go deeper in games than most anybody's, and he had a closer who could go longer and pitch more effectively than most anybody's. And once you looked at the things that offset it, not to mention the best offense they ever had – uh, it, it wasn't a perfect team because you could identify the weak spots, but the balance basically made it one. Yeah, no, I agree. And I say this all the time, and I'm sure I say this on the podcast. It's like when we're talking uh, here at Athlon Sports, we're ranking teams in college football, and we're talking about Alabama and Clemson. Like, we just, with the assumption is that they're awesome. So, like, let's figure out what they might not be great at, and you got to poke holes. So, that's what kind of what we're doing here. I mean, I think 99% of the college baseball teams would love to have Vanderbilt's pitching staff and love to have their problems. Um, so yeah, you know, and, and, and for people listening who want to hear you talk about Drake Fellows and say, oh, he went 13 and two, I get that. But, you know, you look at his numbers compared to the other starters, you know, he, his batting average against was 249, Hickman's was 183, Rockers 233, you know, Fellows gave up almost a hit an inning when you have, you know, Hickman giving up 30 less and Rocker 12 less. So, uh, and I realize Hickman, some of his starts were, were against mid, you know, uh, midweek games, but, uh, I don't think, you know, I think you're being fair to Drake Fellows. He had a, you know, you go 13 and two, you had a really good year. He pitched some great gutsy games, the Mississippi State game, the SEC tournament, the Louisville game. But there were times when he just did not have his best stuff and and gave up some runs there. So, no, I, I agree with everything you just said there. Mitch, I think we've hit just about everything. Was there anything that was maybe a topic that was worth covering that we didn't get to? Uh. I don't think so. I'm trying to think. I'm looking at the looking at the stats. If anything else jumped up, jumped jumps out at me. Um, no, looking you know, looking forward to next year already. Um, <laughs> there's going to be obviously a lot of turnover with the lineup, but uh, the pitching staff, which I'm sure you'll talk about a lot in the off season, but the pitching staff should be better. Has a chance to be better, especially the starters. And um, there's there's more than enough quality bats who didn't play this year who will play, and then some freshmen I'm sure who will will emerge. Next year, I'm trying to think of a, of a similar year as you look forward from this vantage point to next year. I don't remember, I guess the closest thing would be 2015 maybe, the way it looked then. But th- this is different because you lose, I mean, 20, 2014 would have been a similar one where you had some arms coming back, but the, the lineup turned over so much. I guess that's the closest one, but I don't know that, we viewed the pitching as as dominant uh, at, at this point, the summer of 2013, looking to 14, as we view this staff going into 2020. 
Yeah, I was going to say 20, 2011, but we didn't know how good Grayson Garvin was going to be because I, I took some notes earlier. That 2011 staff had Sonny Gray and Grayson Garvin. Garvin actually won SEC Pitcher of the Year. Um, and then Taylor Hill emerged as a senior as a really, really good pitcher. So you had three rock-solid starters there and with, with uh, you know, I think – Navery Moore, Lamb, Will Kleiner, Corey Williams, and TJ Pecorero as a freshman before he got hurt there. So that 2011 pitching staff was among the best Vanderbilt's ever had. I think if you look at identifiable holes, that's still their best team because that team at the time, you know, it didn't have the superstar power in the lineup that this one had in Bladé and Martin, but it was solid one to nine or at least one to eight that I remember. You had the three starting pitchers. Uh, you had two of them. You know, Sonny Gray is still pitching in the majors. Taylor Hill made the majors briefly and was a great third starter. And then in between, you had the SEC Pitcher of the Year, who was a first round pick or I think a competitive balance yeah. A pick. And and then you had that team had two really good middlemen in Zomek and Pecoraro, who, who went midweek and threw out of the pen. Um, and there were some other arms in there too. I think Will Kleiner was on that team. Yeah, Will Kleiner, Corey, Corey Williams, uh, Lamb. So yeah, very deep bullpen. Yeah, I think that's the one that if you looked at it and looked for red flags, that's that's the one that had probably the fewest. I don't think they were as good as this team, but that team was the one that I think was plus one thirty something uh, in, in SEC play and runs, which is just. I don't know if they, if they keep records, you could find it, but I'm, I'm guessing that's maybe the best there's ever been. That that team play, was that team's kind of that one's that's the one that gets a little bit lost. Uh, maybe not because it made Omaha, but I think that's the one that maybe is is better than it gets treated in hindsight. And played in a division with two other elite teams, tied for the SEC championship with Florida and South Carolina. So that you know, it's like playing in the football in the SEC West now almost when you got you know Alabama, LSU, and and whoever else, a and or, you know, uh, Auburn, you know, that, that, that's, it's good. that's, I mean, the league might be better now. You can, I'd have to go back and look, but I think the league might have not have seen three elite teams like that in the same division since. No, you, you had three SEC East teams that were the last four teams standing and they just ended up beating up on each other. That was a team that if you go, I, I did not, because the, the SEC or the NCA does this through the lens of RPI and quality wins and metrics, and, and maybe maybe there were five teams with better resumes than them. I'd, I'd have to go back and look and see what they saw, but that was one of those that, like, when they got a six seed, I'm like, that just doesn't seem right. That that seemed more to me like a two or a three seed, and that might have been what undid that team. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, they, they took care of North Carolina as the three seed twice, but uh, I remember the time – you know, everyone thinking the sixth seed was, was kind of a joke. I, I think it was, especially like when you, the, the run differential is one of the things I look at because it's just like that's you can win some games by being lucky. When you're just beating up on teams like that, that means you're legitimately great. And I think that's that's one of the things that the NCAA a lot of times uh, probably doesn't consider enough. But anyway, uh, Mitch, I'm out of thoughts today. I want to give you the floor to talk about Athlon. I know that the pro football edition, I think you said, is out now. Just tell people what you've got on shelves, where they can find it, and where they can follow you on Twitter. Yeah, athlonsports.com slash store. You can buy all of our magazines. Our, our fantasy magazine will actually be out in about a week, but our, our pro magazine, our SEC football, and our national football magazine are out on newsstands as well. You can follow me on Twitter, Athlon Mitch, and uh, – Already working on college basketball magazine, so that's what we got going on here. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I will be doing editing duties for Blue Ribbon College Basketball starting next week. So it's it's hard to believe that yep. we are getting into college basketball uh, two months before football started. But but here exactly. we are. That's how it works in our business. Well, Mitch, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll probably take a break with you, or or maybe we won't. I don't know. It depends on your schedule. Uh, maybe talk, we, you can talk to my agent about that. We'll, 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 my my people and your people will be in touch uh, about podcasting through the summer. But uh, really appreciate what you added during the season. I know you had to drop off for a while through the Athlon business, which was understandable. But uh, I know a lot of people love your podcast. I get comments on it. And, and thank you for being our guest this year throughout a fantastic baseball season. Yeah, I always enjoy it, Chris. Thanks, bud. He's Mitch Light. I'm Chris Lee. Thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast. Keep following our feed because we're going to have more of these out very soon.